And good afternoon uh, again, and, and apologies for the extended lunch. Um, so we've now reached the sec our second last panel. I see some tired faces, but I'm amazed by the number of people who are still here, uh, because I, you, you must know that this is probably going to be the best panel. Uh, uh, it's, uh, of course, the panel that is concerned with um, the, the most significant interests, uh, liberty interests. It's the panel that's concerned with the things that really, really matter in this area of media law, uh, where the stakes are, are the highest. Um, and it's probably right that I'm here in this side as a moderator, not a member of this illustrious panel, because my experience with speech crimes has usually been on the prosecutorial side uh, of matters. Uh, and in, in one case uh, that I was involved in back in Ontario, we were prosecuting a man who was an author for publishing a book uh, and there's a book about, uh, it was a true crime book about uh, a, a murderer, uh, uh, someone that uh, Paul here will know. Uh, Paul Bernardo uh, was a vicious murderer who abducted, uh, raped, and, and killed two teenage girls. Um, and then, of course, after the trial, you imagine uh, a lot of books and publications come out of that. And this man wrote a book which we alleged had breached a court order. Um, uh, Bernardo was someone who had videotaped uh, the rapes. And as you can imagine, uh, this was the kind of evidence uh, that you would want to keep very, very uh, well protected uh, from the public as the parents of the victims wanted. And in fact, even during the trial, only the judge and the jury could view these tapes. Uh, and interestingly, uh, sort of a balance, uh, the members of the court could actually hear, could, could still hear the audio. Uh, but could not hear the tapes. And of course, the family wanted to make sure that these tapes were destroyed uh, you know, after all the appeals had finished. But the case for the prosecution was that we had suspected that this, this uh, writer, uh, Stephen Williams, had actually somehow been able to get access to the tapes, mostly probably because of his close relations with the defense team. Um, but here was our problem with our case. Uh, what was the evidence that he had gotten access? Well, we said, well, <laughs> simply just read the book. Uh, the evidence is plainly in, in the description and the detail that this uh, uh, person had in the book. But of course, that was, of course, the weakness of the case. It was, it was drawing an inference from something that really wasn't strong enough, uh, uh, particularly when matters uh, of, uh, when we're dealing with matters of publication and expression. Uh, so in the end, the, probably the correct thing happened. That is the prosecution that withdrew the charge. Uh, and so I learned from that uh, experience how very important it is to have a very strong and solid case in matters of speech crimes. And of course, another important principle in this area is the, import is the principle of clarity. And we heard from Peter Norlander uh, yesterday the importance of having bright lines. And this is particularly important in criminal, criminal liability. Um, and of course, we also heard about having the importance of safeguards and protections for the media. Um, and and how, how do we frame these safeguards? Um, uh, Lord Lester talked about the inadequacy of, of balancing, uh, you know, the, this ad hoc balancing. That just doesn't work uh, when it comes to matters of criminal law because journalists really need to have assurances that they're not going to be protected if they publish something. Uh, so exemptions are more, more likely to be the, the, the solution uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. Um, and of course, there will, be, there will be issues where you have an offense that criminalizes speech per se, and you have to stand back and say, well, this offense is, is offensive per se to freedom of expression and should be either repealed or struck down in, in a constitutional case. And that is the first area that we want to begin with, uh, with our first uh, il illustrious panelist, Lord Lester, who's going to talk about uh, the, uh, the UK uh, approach to common law speech crimes. Lord Lester. Thank you very much. Um, in the House of Lords, we have a series of customs, uh, and Lord Hunt will confirm the truth of what I'm about to say. One of ours is that if a speaker speaks for too long, we scream at them too long. Another is that if we read, they scream, reading. I'm neither going to read nor to speak for too long. And the reason I'm not going to speak for too long is because there are too many speakers 
on the platform that I want to hear, and I have spoken too long already. <laughs> Therefore, all I'm now going to say is that it was all the fault of the British uh, that, we, <laughs> that we derived speech crimes out of the Court of Star Chamber and the medieval ecclesiastical courts. Those crimes were mainly designed to protect uh, public order, uh, as today is the case apparently in mainland China. Uh, when Macaulay uh, drafted the Indian Penal Code uh, on a boat on his way to India, he inserted a great many speech crimes that have been built upon and extended even worse than they were in the middle of the 19th century. So if you look at the Indian Penal Code as interpreted in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, and places east of that, including what used to be called Burma, you will see plenty of overbroad, vague, unnecessary speech crimes. Uh, in uh, the UK, uh, we decided that it was not really desirable to have speech crimes at common law that were too vague, that sprawled too widely, and that infringed free speech. And so, after our Law Commission had produced various reports about which little happened, uh, the previous government decided to accept a campaign that some of us ran to get rid of them. And so I'm glad to report that we got rid of the common law of obscene libel, of criminal libel, of seditious libel, and of blasphemous libel, except in Northern Ireland, because in Northern Ireland they have devolved power and have not yet done anything about blasphemy. Uh, David Hunt and I were involved in a peculiarly enjoyable uh, uh, issue, which will interest some of you, uh, ab about blasphemy. Uh, having had great pressure, especially from British Muslims, to extend the law of blasphemy, to make it a crime, to uh, insult the prophet uh, as well as the Christian God, um, the Labour government worried that they would lose votes at a general election to, the, to my party because my party had been against the invasion of Iraq uh, and the Labour party had been led by Blair into the war. They wrote to every mosque, all 1,200 mosques at the time, within uh, England and Wales, and said, if you vote Labour, we promise we will give you a law uh, um, criminalizing uh, insult against religion. And they did. And then it came to the Lords, uh, and David and I, he a conservative, uh, I a liberal democrat, joined forces with a mighty elderly ar ar army um, <laughs> across, across parties. And in the House of Lords, uh, we met, I, I drafted one day, in a half an hour, what became known as the English Pen Clause. Uh, and the, not only did we put the burden of proof on the prosecution, uh, not only did we require specific intent, but we wrote a clause in which to my amazement became uh, approved by the Lords, which said basically it's fine to insult, ridicule, and otherwise make fun of religion. The very opposite of what had been <laughs> demanded. Uh, it, it then went to the House of Commons, normally controlled by the government of the day. But on the day in question, I don't suppose David remembers this, but on the day in question, uh, Mr. Blair was so confident of winning that he dispatched 25 of his members of parliament to Scotland to a by-election. Mm -hmm. And that meant that the Commons supported the Hunt-Lester Amendment by one vote. <laughs> As a result of that, it is now the law of the land. And so that wasn't going to be a common law speech crime. It was going to be a, a statutory speech crime. It is now unenforceable and quite right too. And then the last thing that we had to worry about was Okay, race hate crimes are there and are quite strict, probably too strict in our system. Uh, 
what do you do about homophobic hate? Do you classify homophobic hate speech as more like race hate speech or more like, or more like religious hate speech? I try to argue that it was more like race hate speech, since when you are born, you don't choose your sex, your sexual orientation. Others argued that it's more like religious hate speech, since homosexuality involves not only what you are, but how you behave. Uh, and I was teased in the House of Lords, as David may remember, uh, by Lord Waddington and others, because they applied my logic about religious hate speech to homophobic hate speech, as a result of which there is much more latitude for free speech dealing with homophobia than uh, in dealing with race. And that's probably actually, in the end, a fairly sensible result. So our parliament has been extremely active. And then finally we come to scandalizing the judiciary, that bit of contempt uh, law, uh, which uh, is, again, of ancient origin. I, I said, I think, at yesterday's meeting that there was a foolish attempt in Northern Ireland to commit Peter Hain, a uh, former senior Labour minister, for contempt in being rude about a Northern Irish judge. Uh, and uh, when the Attorney General saw the attack upon that which would have been made before the judges, he surrendered and backed off. Uh, we then decided that it was sensible to get rid of that branch as well. The judges were consulted, and they agreed that they didn't, just as God does not need criminal law to protect him or her against insult, so the judges don't need criminal law to protect them against uh, rude things being said about them and criticizing them. Uh, and, and they can, if they want to, uh, sue for libel, of course. Uh, and the judges found no need. The Law Commission that had started an investigation also found no need to preserve. The Law Commission are now looking more broadly at contempt of court of law, but we have got rid of that speech crime too, and I very much hope that what we have done might be interesting in other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Okay, so I want to move now from one legislator to another legislator and to talk about a special kind of speech crimes. And these are speech crimes that take place in the context of national security issues where, of course, the stakes there as well are very high as well and, and invites uh, a very difficult balancing exercise. So our next speaker is uh, the Honorable Mr. Dennis Kwok. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think any discussion of national national security law in Hong Kong would have to begin with uh, Article 23 of the Basic Law. And I think it is important to, to remind ourselves the, the, the exact wordings of Article 23 in any discussion. The Hong Kong SAR region shall enact on its own, on its own, to prohibit any act of treason, secession, sedition, subversion against the central people's government. Now, the reason I emphasize the word on its own is because the, the, the basic law, the drafters of the basic law have specifically put Article 23 in such a way that it allows the Hong Kong people to decide when and how, precisely how, national securities laws are to be enacted in Hong Kong. Now, there are several ways of doing it. If, it, had it been in the, the intention of the basic law drafters to uh, simply apply the PRC national securities law directly to Hong Kong. There are actually ways of doing so. There are lists of nation PRC national laws that apply directly to Hong Kong, specified in Schedule 3 of the basic law. The nationality law of PRC being one example. But the drafters of the basic law did not do that. It specifically carved out um, the, uh, the right of the Hong Kong people to uh, decide when and how uh, to enact these uh, national security laws. Now, when I read out Article 23, I think it became immediately clear that national security laws is simply a label. It doesn't really require Hong Kong to, to come up with a brand new legislation of national security law. 
It only requires the Hong Kong SAR to enact on its own legislation prohibiting acts of treason, secession, sedition, subversion against this central people's government. Now, the um, Article 23 Concern Group uh, 10 years ago what was at pains at pointing out to the government that under our existing body of legislation in Hong Kong, there are already most of these provisions in the existing body of laws in Hong Kong. You don't need a whole brand uh, new legislation called the National Security Legislation to legislate these areas. These areas are, have already been covered by existing legislative provisions. All you need, all you need is to amend certain parts of the, for example, the crimes ordinance to create express offenses, criminalizing acts of secession and subversion against the central people's government. Those are the real uh, changes that are needed for Hong Kong to fulfill its constitutional obligation under Article 23. But of course, 10 years ago, you remember what happened was that the government tried to ram through this national security bill, which was deeply unpopular for many reasons. Uh, to give you an example, state secrets were simply not defined or very vaguely defined under that bill. What is state secret? In China, um, virtually everything that is to do with government can be, can be uh, classified as state secret. A few months ago, I was in Beijing uh, giving a talk on uh, environmental protection law to a group of law students, and they asked me, is an environmental impact assessment report uh, a state secret in Hong Kong? Um, I said, no, how can an EIA report be a state secret? But in China, an EIA report is a state secret. If you use it or somehow get hold of it to uh, try to make use of an EIA report, you could be arrested for uh, misusing or stealing state secret. So you can see immediately uh, 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 the, the, the difference between the two legal systems when it comes to these things. So politically uh, speaking, 10 years ago, the Hong Kong people stood up against the enactment of Article 23 legislation. And ever since then, it has been a sort of a, a thing that uh, no government officials would ever want to touch. But the, the, the question still remains is that there is a constitutional obligation uh, for the Hong Kong people to enact uh, laws regarding subversion, secession, etc. But um, I believe that the, the Hong Kong legislature right now is not um, ideal to, uh, is not in an ideal situation to deal with legislation of, of, of this nature because of its composition. Um, until we have the system sorted out, uh, until we have uh, democratic reforms, uh, uh, gone through the legislature and our executive arm of government, I don't think politically Hong Kong is in, in, in the right place to deal with uh, Article 23. But until then, I think we, we, we need to um, be very careful about talking about Article 23 legislation. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Dennis. One thing you haven't mentioned is, of course, those existing laws that we have are the same laws that Lord Lester has been criticizing, and are those laws that go too far on their face. Of course, they're not used in practice. So, of course, there's, a, there's another side to the whole Article 23 story, which is to see it as an opportunity to either you know, abolish or to modernize uh, those offenses. And that's one aspect that really doesn't come to the surface in this debate. I want to put the uh, topic of national security in a broader international context. Uh, and our ne next speaker has had some really interesting experiences uh, in this respect, uh, representing WikiLeaks uh, and Julian Assange. Uh, and uh, uh, our speaker is uh, Jennifer Robinson, who uh, uh, studied law in Australia and, and who, who I learned yesterday was taught by Andrew Burns, uh, f a former colleague of ours uh, here at Hong Kong University. Uh, and, uh, and then she was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford, and of course, uh, her life has uh, never been the same since then. Uh, so uh, Jen, Jen Robinson is the Director of Legal Advocacy at the Bertha Foundation, and she'll be talking about the Espionage Act and the Official Secrets Act and many other interesting things. It's a great pleasure to be asked to come and speak today about WikiLeaks and Assange and national security and actually talk about the substance of the issue and the law instead of whether, as Bill Keller wrote in the New York Times, he has dirty white socks <laughs> and, and smells and doesn't shower. And people ask me, do you like him? He seems like a bit of a creep. 
<laughs> and to be honest, I do like him, but I don't have to. And that's beside the point. And it's a shame that so much public debate is eaten up by these personal details rather than the really important issues that WikiLeaks raises in terms of free speech. And in, in particular, the way the governments, in particular the US government, has responded to WikiLeaks. Another uh, point that I just want to raise too, which also eats up the debate, is this idea about and the debate around whether Julian Assange is a journalist or not. And that came up as a question to Jill Phillips yesterday um, in the and it is constantly debated. And actually, I want to make the point that, of course, Julian self-identifies as a journalist and is a card-carrying member of the Australian Media Union. Um, but at the same time, he's also a publisher. And as a matter of law, provided that we all agree that he's a publisher, free speech rights and the First Amendment will apply to WikiLeaks. So whether or not he's a journalist or not, I think, distracts us from the more important points that are raised. So I want to talk today about publication and national security and speech crimes. In terms of law and broader policy debate, national security is probably my most hated term. It's wheeled out by governments in many different circumstances uh, to justify a wide range of impositions and uh, impositions on human rights and, and in particular free speech. With very little evidence, it's this trust us, we know better, don't you worry approach which I think, in light of the Snowden revelations, um, leaves everyone feeling a little bit cynical. So today I want to talk specifically about the criminalisation of the leak of national security information and also the potential criminalisation of the publication of that information, which is an issue that is at risk when we consider the fact that WikiLeaks is subject to a grand jury investigation in the United States. We know that that is considering the Espionage Act and that this is a publisher. Of course, the New York Times, The Guardian, and other mainstream media organizations who also publish the material that we now know Bradley Manning has admitted to giving to WikiLeaks are not the subject of a grand jury, but WikiLeaks is. Um, there has been a lot of debate in the United States about why that is, why only WikiLeaks, and Professor Joho Benkler at Harvard University has said specific, uh, in particularly, that there is no reason to distinguish between WikiLeaks as a publisher and the New York Times as a publisher. And the only reason that they've been able to do that because they won't go after the New York Times because of the PR issues. It would look terrible to go after the New York Times. And yet the principles raised by going after WikiLeaks are precisely the same. And the principles that are raised as a matter of law are precisely the same. So I, I want to focus on the Espionage Act in particular um, having been consumed by the issue for the past three years, representing Julian, advising him in relation to the Bradley Manning proceedings, attending the Bradley Manning proceedings in the United States. He was, of course, convicted on six counts of espionage just this summer. And the implications that will have for Snowden, um, who I think has probably overtaken international news cycle in terms of the release of national defense information. We're facing a situation where Julian Assange is in an embassy having sought asylum because of the risk of extradition to the United States to face prosecution for his publication with WikiLeaks. And also the fact that Edward Snowden has now sought asylum in Russia because of his leak to The Guardian in relation to national defense information. And I think it's important to note that there's no public interest defense or exception in the Espionage Act. So it doesn't, uh, I'd actually like to do a little poll. Who here hands raised, thinks that what Edward Snowden released was in the public interest. And who here thinks that The Guardian did the right thing in publishing that information so that it's made available to us? <laughs> Special kudos to Jill, who's in the, the edit legal, legal uh, lawyer for The Guardian who has negotiated this process. Now, even though that material is in the public interest, Edward Snowden, should he be returned to the US, would face strict liability, pretty much strict liability, and would be convicted under the Espionage Act for giving that information to The Guardian. <coughs> what people don't of often talk about is the fact that in the Pentagon Papers case, um, they specifically mandated that while there would be no prior restraint on media organisations from publishing the material, they left open the possibility that there could be criminal prosecution down the line. 
Now, I think it's really important to talk about this in the context of the chilling impact that that has on free speech. Whenever I talk about WikiLeaks, um, and I only have 10 minutes, so I'm, I'm trying to rush through it, and it's a lot to cover. So what I'm not going to talk about is comparative issues with the Official Secrets Act and the fact that there is also no public interest exception there. And I'd, I hope that we can bring that out in discussion with Jill Phillips, perhaps, at the end of this. I'm also not going to talk about the new federal shield law in the US and the, ex the national security exemption, which exception which has been placed in that, but does factor into this debate. And I hope perhaps Charles Glasser might be able to contribute to a discussion on that after. But the most important thing about WikiLeaks is I always refer to Goodwin in the United Kingdom on the importance of the protection of sources. And it says, protection of journalistic sources is one of the basic conditions for fre press freedom. Without such protection, sources may be deterred from assisting the press in informing the public on matters of public interest. As a result, the vital public watchdog role of the press may be undermined, and the ability of the press to provide accurate and reliable information may be adversely affected. Now, while we have, we acknowledge that the press should be free in, in most circumstances, to publish material they've received from a source, even if that source may be subject to prosecution for having disclosed it. The one situation where that might be in question is in national security cases. I've already explained the grand jury and why Julian has sought asylum, but just a little bit about that process. It is a secret process. We won't know whether or not there is an indictment for Julian unless and until it is unsealed for the purposes of extradition. What we do know, because of what has been leaked and what has come out in the Bradley Manning proceedings, is that Julian and a number of other individuals are the subject of an investigation in relation to the Espionage Act and potentially other uh, potential crimes related to compu computer crimes uh, in relation to the revelations made by Bradley Manning. Now, Bradley Manning himself who was the alleged source and has since admitted, was convicted over the summer. And that case was actually reported in the press. If you just did a glance in the press when it came out, it was actually reported as a victory because he was accused of a very serious crime, aiding the enemy. Now, aiding the enemy by providing material to WikiLeaks, which was then published by media organisations, carries the potential death penalty. He was found not guilty on that particular charge but he was still found guilty on six charges of espionage, which is incredibly serious. But because he was found not guilty on aiding the enemy, people sort of forgot about the espionage um, convictions. And what that means is, under the Espionage Act, I mean, what does it say? It makes it a crime for an individual with unauthorised possession of information relating to the national defence to communicate that information to others or to retain it and refuse to give it back to the United States where it could cause damage to the United States. Now, the Act doesn't refer to classified information. It refers to the disclosure of certain information related to national defence. But in the cases that have been decided in the United States, that's been equated with material that has been classified. In a case called Morrison, it was also made clear that this applied not just to what you might think in relation to assisting foreign governments or some sort of spy thriller where you've got someone from the CIA selling his secrets to Russia. This actually applies to giving information to the media. And unlike several provisions, other provisions in the Espionage Act, you don't have, there's no requirement to show bad faith or intent to cause damage to the United States. It's, it's enough, oh, there's n and like I said, there's no public interest defence. So you don't have to, the person can say, I intend to give this to the press because I think it's in the public interest. I don't think it's going to do any harm. And in fact, the disclosure hasn't caused any major harm to the United States. In the cases that have been decided recently, Bradley Manning's being the most recent, John Kiriakou, the CIA operative who revealed to the press CIA waterboarding techniques and ended up pleading guilty um, to several charges under the Espionage Act, is that it is inadmissible before the court to adduce evidence as to the particular person's intent, whether they intended to harm United States interests, it is also inadmissible and irrelevant to show that it caused actual harm to the United States. So as long as you release information and transmit it to a media organisation without authorisation, you can be convicted under the Espionage Act. 
And it's interesting, the Espionage Act is a relic. It dates to, the 19, to 1917. And I did a little bit of research <coughs> into this, and as early as 1945, one of the great jurists in US legal history, Judge Leonard Hand, warned of the dangers of having no public interest exception. You find yourself in a situation where someone like Bradley Manning, who revealed evidence of war crimes, who revealed evidence of torture, who revealed evidence of corruption, can't raise any of the public interest in that material in any defense to a charge under the Espionage Act. Edward Snowden, the same. And in 1945, it was written, the Espionage Act, as enacted, necessarily implies that there are some kinds of information relating to the national defense which must not be given to a friendly power, not even to an ally, no matter how innocent or even commendable the purpose of the sender may be. Obviously, so drastic a repression of the free exchange of information, it is wise carefully to scrutinize lest extravagant and absurd consequences result. 1945. In another seminal article on the Espionage Act, um, two professors, Edgar and Schmidt, wrote that since World War I, we have lived in a state of benign indeterminacy about the legal rules governing publication of national security information. The crux of the problem, they explain, is that despite a legislative history, that, I quote, may fairly be read as excluding criminal sanctions for well-meaning publication of national security information, the language of the Espionage Act has to be bent to exclude such publication from the statute's reach. In practice, what that meant, and in earlier cases interpreting this provision, was that the intent and the harm cause was relevant, but more recent cases have excluded that as a possibility. Now, so far, there hasn't been a, publication, a prosecution rather, of a publisher. There's been a number of successful prosecutions of whistleblowers, but WikiLeaks is the first publishing organisation to be the subject of a grand jury for publication of that information. And this raises real concerns about free speech protections. I think it's in and of enough that whistleblowers themselves would be subjected to criminal sanction for public interest disclosures, but that a publisher may be. And just to quickly round up, why might that be? In the Pentagon Papers case, again, it was about prior restraint. But in that case, several of the judges recognised that there may well be circumstances where the damage was so great or the, the potential damage was so great that they would order prior restraint. What they also found, a number of the judges, was that on the facts of that particular case, that was the Pentagon Papers related to Vietnam, they didn't see that there would be irreparable harm and there wasn't the justification for prior restraint, but they did say on the same facts in circumstances where you can't justify prior restraint, you may nevertheless be in a situation where the publisher could face criminal sanction for having published that material. It hasn't been tested, obviously, um, because there hasn't been a prosecution, but commentators say that it could apply to a publisher because of the Pentagon Papers case and more recent cases. You might sit there and say, well, they've only gone after government officers who themselves have an obligation uh, to the US government not to disclose. But actually, there has been a case under the Espionage Act, uh, a case called Rosen, which didn't involve privity with the US government. It involved prosecution not just of a US government officer, but also a number of lobbyists who had been given the information and then transmitted it to a third party. On those two principles put together, there is a concern that it is possible that a publisher could be found crim criminally liable, even in the United States under the First Amendment, for publishing national security information. And th to me, I find this incredible. We talk a lot about the First Amendment being the bastion of free speech. But in this day and age, to be applying a 1917 statute and potentially applying it to a publisher, I think raises fundamental questions about free speech. And hopefully we can explore that a little bit more and the question, the question is really, is this satisfactory? Is this satisfactory in this day and age that editors have to make that call? Now, the New York Times has developed a, a practice where they now, and I frankly found this amazing when I found out post WikiLeaks, that they actually go and show the government what they're about to publish. And I think this is probably mm. a reaction to wanting to protect themselves against potential further Espionage Act issues down the track. Is this satisfactory? Should editors be facing that kind of cost-benefit analysis? Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you very much for that. There, there was reference uh, in your presentation to the merits of having a public interest defense, but it's not entirely clear how such a defense would work for criminal liability. It would have to be spelled out very clearly, uh, otherwise it would still have a, really a chilling effect. But we can explore these kinds of questions uh, in, in our uh, question uh, time. Um, there's been a lot of talk in this conference about uh, libel tourism, uh, but I think as apt for this panel, we, we really should be talking about criminal libel tourism. Uh, uh, whatever that might mean. Um, it could mean t two things. One, of course, it could be referring to the possible extraterritorial reach of criminal laws, uh, or it could well be, you know, what are the places you would want to avoid? Um, and this uh, uh, leads me to introduce our next speaker, who's going to tell us about uh, a, possibly a, a criminal libel tourism place, uh, which is Singapore. Um, M. Ravi, of course, uh, is uh, a very prominent uh, human rights lawyer, uh, and as mentioned earlier, uh, has the claim to fame of representing Alan Sheldrick, uh, who's been subjected to some of these uh, speech crimes in Singapore. And you're going to talk about uh, the use of sedition and defamation uh, in Singapore. Thank you very much. <laughs> A very good afternoon, everyone. I decided to stand up and speak because I will have better access to those who are sleeping after lunch. <laughs> My topic is barriers to free speech in Singapore. And to illustrate how free speech has been restricted in Singapore, I would like to show examples by way of recent developments in court. I'm sure you would have seen that in Singapore, there is um, the Singapore leadership has this reputation of suing their political opponents to bankruptcy in areas of defamation, which bars the political opponents from standing up in elections. The defamation jurisprudence in Singapore has elevated the political public figure to an exalted position of almost giving them a special reputation over and above the constitutional civil liberties enshrined in the Constitution. The eight grounds upon which free speech can be restricted has been widely uh, interpreted by the courts in more deference to giving um, to this notion of communitarian ideology over individual rights. And it is quite disturbing to see that in its wide interpretation in restricting these eight areas of, uh, uh, imposing these eight areas of restrictions, that they ha the courts have increasingly uh, not recognizing that issue of um, giving more um, importance to proportionality and the necessity of restricting these rights. And this is in stark contrast to the US First Amendment jurisprudence. However, in Singapore, it seems that uh, the way the judiciary is going uh, seems to accord with this communitarian ideology of neo-confusion ethos that they seem to be adopting. And in this process, the judiciary seems to have um, stand on its head on the, of the notion of a public figure. And what happens in the result is that the political leadership seem to be enjoying um, uh, two, you know, their status is twice blessed. One is that they seem to be enjoying more damages when they are sued. Secondly, they seem to have equal rights 
like others, you know, when they're equally protected vis-a-vis um, -vis individuals under the Constitution. So therefore, the whole notion of um, in defamation law, when political leadership are questioned, where they should be open to criticism, seems to be not resonating in the Supreme Court of Singapore. The next issue is the question of Reynolds privilege. How does it operate in Singapore? In the case of review publishing, which involves a foreign publication, the Singapore Court of Appeal has rejected Reynolds privilege. However, in rejecting it, they have made a very narrow pronouncement whereby um, the protection for civil, uh, civil liberties in the area of free expression is only guaranteed for Singapore citizens and not foreigners. So there seem to be a suggestion that Reynolds privilege could be extended in future cases. Somehow the PowerPoint, okay. Now, that brings focus on the Freedom Index of Singapore. Whilst on the one hand, Singapore is competing with um, Hong Kong, New York, and London in the sphere of uh, economics, it seems to be competing with Qatar and uh, Iraq in the area of Freedom in Index, and um, it, is, it ranks 153 of the 197 countries in the world. Now, I just covered the area of defamation. And the other issue that cropped up recently is the issue of public bodies suing private citizens. This is uh, a 21-year-old girl who I happen to represent recently. She was sued by, she was uh, almost sued by um, a statutory body, the Council for Private Education. She received a letter of demand, and she was threatened with defamation proceedings. I took out an application in court for a declaration that statutory bodies should not be suing private citizens, although that principle, Derbyshire principle, uh, applied generally to elected bodies. But before we could, I could extend my arms to bring in Derbyshire in Singapore, that matter got settled. So we have to see another day. But it was interesting to note that the arguments for the lawyers for the uh, statutory body, they argued that, oh, Singapore's social political climate should, be, uh, should restrict the application of Derbyshire principle. So Derbyshire is not applied in Singapore, but it has been applied in um, our neighboring country, Malaysia, and um, Hong Kong, and, and, and other countries. Now, contempt of court. I happen to represent uh, Alan Shadrick, who wrote the book, Once a Jolly Hangman. Uh, it's a criticism of uh, the application of death penalty and the way um, there was discriminatory treatment, alleged discriminatory treatment over uh, wealthy individuals and certain countries that have been favored when their citizens face death penalty. And Alan Shedrick's case drew international uh, attention. And um, on the day when he was sentenced, of course, he was convicted. On the day he was sentenced, I was supposed to present his plea in mitigation. And you see how remorseful my client is outside the court. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose uh, his book got greater sales as a result of uh, <laughs> these contempt proceedings. And I suppose uh, he was drawing attention from there. <laughs> uh, one interesting improvement in this area of contempt of court is that Alan Shadrick's case overturned four decades of precedence where the inherent tenancy had been applied for contempt cases. You know, inherent tenancy, it has a very, very low threshold, almost making our judiciary look like fragile flowers. And, and this test has a very threshold where act or statements is deemed to be contemptuous if it conveys to an average reasonable reader allegations of bias lack of impartiality, impropriety, or any wrongdoing concerning a judge in the exercise of his judicial function. And this, we managed to shift this test to the real risk test, on the other hand, that requires the prosecution to show that there must be more than a remote possibility that the statements complained would undermine the administration of justice, just like how it's applied this real risk test in Hong Kong, New Zealand, and I understand that uh, scandalizing judiciary has been abolished uh, in UK, although that test was applied there. And thanks to Media Defense uh, Legal Initiative, they helped us and Doughty Street Chambers in, so that I was able to advance those arguments in support of uh, shifting this test. 
that was uh, scandalizing judiciary. The other area of contempt of court that recently surfaced out is in the area of uh, sub -judice. Um I happen to represent Lin Lee. Uh, she's a filmmaker. She, was, uh, she did a documentary of uh, four uh, workers from China who had been working in Singapore. The, this, these were bus drivers. They went on strike. Um, whilst criminal proceedings were ongoing, she filmed these workers uh, about um, police brutality and how they, they confessed to their crimes. And this went online, and she was investigated for contempt of court. And Lin Lee is, you know, is sitting there. She has, she has a project, I guess. Uh, Lin Lee, can you wave your hand? She's really a brave lady. <laughs> yeah. And what is interesting is that uh, the Attorney General Chambers investigated her case and decided to drop uh, the charge, decided not to proceed uh, against her for contempt of court, but they said that she was guilty of contempt of court and they will give stern warning. This is bizarre because the Attorney General Chambers serve a different function. It should be the court who should be deciding this, but instead they issued a stern warning. Now, bringing to the last topic, sedition. <laughs> You know, really, Singapore leadership lacks sense of humor. <laughs> we are getting the, we are, we are beginning, be, beginning to become the most stressful society in the world. And it seems there's some in, index to that, that we are the least happiest people. And the sedition charges were brought against a cartoonist in Singapore. He said that he imagined this place called Democratic Singapore. And his cartoon illustrated how, over the years, the minority ethnic Malay population, which had a greater birth rate, but interestingly, um, the, the, the immigration policies were geared in such a way that their population started uh, decreasing. So it was geared towards um, basically, he was trying to say that the Chinese population had gone down, and so they had to replace that by bringing foreign Chinese population in Singapore. So he was faced with sedition charge. And the charge was weak because to start with, sedition, you know, traditionally sedition is for treason and uh, incitement to mutiny and armed insurre in, uh, insurrection. Uh, that is old colonial law. Section 3.2 of the Sedition Act provides that a publication is seditious because if it shows some ill will or hatred among races, it promotes ill will or hatred among uh, uh, races. But Leslie's cartoon is exactly the opposite of that. It is actually to criticize how the government had been discriminating against a particular minority. In fact, he has a perfect defense under the law that uh, any matters producing having with a tendency to remove any ill will or hatred among the races, and that's what uh, Leslie was doing. Finally, they decided to proceed uh, with a contempt of court charge against him, and in relation to the sedition charge, they dropped the charge, and what is interesting is that the government issued a statement through the Attorney General's chambers, and they said that where the statements or actions are heinous, a firm line will be taken, for example, the burning of the Quran or the Bible will not be allowed in Singapore under the cover of freedom of expression or freedom of speech or expression. How on earth are you comparing this cartoon to the burning of Quran? <laughs> I think they have a great sense of humor there. <laughs> well, Leslie thinks that uh, in his democratic Singapore, that there are still lawyers to defend him. Thank you. The contempt case uh, that you talked about involving Lin Li sounds a lot like a, a case in Hong Kong that is developing, involving journalists who had interviewed a defendant who was just arrested, allegedly for killing his parents. And the journalists were somehow were able to get access to him and, and interview him, actually. Uh, and, and contempt proceedings are now, are now pending. Our fifth speaker is Malik Samwar, who is also a very prominent human rights lawyer from Malaysia. Uh, and uh, from 2006 to 2012, had led a, a human rights uh, organization uh, in Malaysia. And he will talk about uh, some of the rule of law uh, issues and, and challenges uh, that are occurring there. Th 
Thank you, Simon. Um, firstly, thank you for having uh, given me an opportunity to address you today um, and the trip to Hong Kong. It's been quite a while. And um, I remember being here in 95 for a master's program. And I enjoyed my time then, although the university has changed considerably in the time in between. Um, now, when I first got uh, told that I was on this panel, um, I struggled a little bit about what it is that I was going to talk about. One of the difficulties we have when we, well, those of us from Southeast Asia, is when we attend conferences like this, um, unfortunately, there will be a tendency towards an assumption that the rule of law operates in some fashion or other in the countries you, uh, some of the speakers come from, like in, in, from the UK or Australia, Canada. And as much as you may complain about the way things happen there, or you may suggest that the rule of law is under threat, I don't think it's anywhere close to what it is um, like in those countries where we come from. And um, I was very inspired to listen to Mr. Poo uh, during lunch, and I'm, I'm ha happy to have been, had a chance to hear him, because what he said, I think, reflects um, the feelings of many of us who practice uh, in human rights law in Southeast Asia, um, to, to differing standards, of course. And going back to what um, Mr. Ravi was saying earlier, um, it's interesting that the grass is always green on, on the other side, because those of us who live in Malaysia where we have to virtually pay for everything on a privatized basis, from security to healthcare to education and so on, often look at Singapore with um, some uh, wonderment. And, and so it's quite true that the grass is always greener on the other side. And they have a functioning judiciary that you know, may be conservative, may be seen to be uh, political in, in some instances, but by and large know what they're doing all the time when it comes to the civil commercial cases that they handle. And that's essential for uh, maintaining confidence in that institution. All right. Okay, so um, I thought what I'd do is, is broaden the, 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 the scope of the discussion a little bit more and perhaps um, take the liberty of attempting to address uh, uh, the regional uh, concerns or problems that, that we face in Southeast Asia when we talk of um, uh, speech crimes. And I think the, the best way to do this is to perhaps understand how it is and uh, the, the, the intentions underlying the, either the enacting or the maintaining of uh, provisions of law that uh, stifle free speech, usually with a penal consequence. And to me, um, I've, having done this for about 15 years now, um, well, a bit longer than that, it comes down to what I think essentially is a desire on the part of our governments, and I say our, I mean those governments in this region, um, to maintain power, notwithstanding um, perhaps a lack of popular support. Um, in the recent Malaysian general elections, it's interesting that 53% of the country wanted this government out. We didn't get them out. And they have a significant majority in parliament. So that's interesting to me. So what's happened is over the years, um, governments that have got very comfortable with where they are, and perhaps leaders who uh, like the trappings of power uh, and like the opportunities that power um, brings with it, um, in, in particular, I speak of corruption. I think it's no secret that many of the countries in this part of the world are notoriously corrupt. And we were told recently that Malaysia now is almost uh, close, uh, well, is second to only China in terms of uh, co corruption in, in business and commerce. Um, and that's interesting because you know, we have 27 million people only. So I think if you apply a um, proportionality to that, I think we're probably far high on that scale. So um, some of you may see in the CNN adverts about Malaysia truly being Asia. So I suppose <laughs> that it is for you. <laughs> All right. OK, so we have essentially tremendous abuses of power. Uh, we have tremendous corruption. And what we once used to think of um, uh, about uh, African leaders from somewhat despotic countries in terms of the amounts of money they were stealing uh, could possibly be said to apply to many of these countries in this region. Um, and it doesn't surprise us anymore when, in fact, it doesn't surprise ministers in my country when disclosures are made about their children owning $7 million properties, and the minister will say, well, I don't know anything about that. That's him. Well, notwithstanding that that son could be 23 years old and have no uh, income. Uh, well, you know, there it is. So when you have uh, leaders or leadership or governments that thrive on this sort of thing and want to maintain their hold over power, then obviously the first thing they have to do 
um, is to stifle dissent. Um, and so laws are then uh, enacted or modified uh, or interpreted in a way, and I'm going to come back to the interpretation subsequently, but interpreted in a way that allows for this stifling of dissent under a veneer of legitimacy. All right? So it's, it's in this context that we see many um, uh, provisions of law being utilized or used, perhaps aimed for a different purpose at the outset, but now being used to an end um, uh, entirely designed to stifle dissent and to maintain political power, usually with the co-opting of other state institutions like the judiciary, the attorney general's chambers, or the police. Um, so just to give you a sense of how things could be, for those of you who perhaps wish things were a little bit better where you come from, uh, let me give you a list of what we have in Malaysia. And this is not in, in any way a complete list. So we have um, criminal defamation. It's in the penal code. You get two years and a fine for that. Uh, we have sedition. Uh, it's three years and a fine for that. And um, it's based on a seditious tendency. Truth is not a defense. Um, uh, then now we have something quite interesting. It's a, it's a new offense, which is called um, activity detrimental to parliamentary democracy. And amongst the way this can be achieved, according to the law, is uh, by any unconstitutional means. I have no idea what that means. Parliament obviously did know what it meant. Uh, you get 10 years for that. Um, and um, apart from actually uh, committing the offense uh, directly, that particular provision also provides that if anyone seeks to raise funds for activity detrimental to parliamentary democracy, whatever that means, then the solicitation of those funds is, is in itself an offense. And you can get up to 10 years for that. Now, if I received an email from an organizer of such an event, and I forwarded it on, I'm under a duty to report that to the police. And if I don't, I get a couple of years for that. <laughs> and if I do forward it on to a third party and say, why don't you support this by giving some money, then I get 10 years for that. <laughs> so we haven't quite seen how this works. But this is what is now considered in Malaysia to be a security offense. A, a type of offense that allows our um, uh, ex attorney general to invoke uh, security procedural laws, which reverses the burden of proof, et cetera, et cetera. So the terror procedure comes into play if the attorney general says this is a security offense. And amongst the many things that happens then is that he can wiretap with no impediment. Um, the burden of proof is reversed. You can have secret trials. Um, if you get acquitted by the High Court, assuming you're so lucky, you're not released, you're kept in custody up to the final appeal in the federal court, and sometimes that can take up to two years. So there it is. Okay, so that's just one part of it. Then now we have something called the um, a pre a pre a Presumption of Publication in Our Evidence Act, which essentially says this, I'm paraphrasing, but um, if you allow your picture, um, your photo, or, or, or you use a particular pseudonym, and, that, and those things are associated with a particular blog site or website, then it's presumed that you are the publisher and you have the duty of rebutting. Now, it may look pretty farcical, I think it is, but uh, when you understand the context in, in, in which this law was enacted, it gets very, very frightening because some of you have, have, may have read that in Malaysia, like, like in Indonesia some years earlier, there is beginning to be displays of um, uh, dissatisfaction, and people are beginning to demonstrate in a way they never used to. Um, amongst the groups that are organizing these sorts of things are groups that are looking at free and fair elections, nothing more than that. And so the last rally, we had something like 350,000 people on the streets of KL, which is quite a significant number considering uh, the fact that most Malaysians don't want to get in trouble for anything. Um, so because the government understands that they're not going to be able to break the will of the people in the usual way, what they've done is to create laws, albeit in the name of national security, that allow them to attack and isolate um, uh, organizers and potentially bleed off. I mean, it's quite clever. It's divide and rule. I think we were taught that by the British when they first colonized us, um, and subsequently when they helped us deal with the communist insurgency in the 60s. But you know, it's, it's worked very effectively at, at home. And on top of that, we have uh, laws that, uh, by which the government regulates the press. So if you want to run a newspaper, you need a permit. You can get that permit revoked if you publish things that the government doesn't like. They're beginning to talk about um, controlling uh, 
publications on the internet, they're not sure how to do it because we've given this promise of no censorship um, much earlier in time when we, when we were trying to attract investment for a multimedia super corridor in Malaysia. But they're beginning to look at the use of sedition laws um, and criminal defamation also in the context of publications of that nature. So as things stand now, I know of at least nine instances of, of, of people having been charged for sedition within the last uh, year. Uh, many of them uh, in connection with publications concerning the last elections, which you know, by and large most Malaysians think were, uh, think was, were hijacked. All right, so we have then under the same law that allows for regulation of the press, we have the power of the minister to ban books. And this has been happening quite a bit um, as well. Uh, we had a publisher recently uh, translate Irshad Manji's uh, book on um, Allah and liberty and feminism uh, into the Malay language. Uh, the book had been in circulation in, in, the, in the English language for about a year and a half. But when it was translated, the book was banned. And on top of that, the publisher, one of the directors of the company, was charged for offenses under Islamic laws, which I'm going to come to in a minute. Um, so we're we were quite successful in getting um, the ban order quashed. All it took was I appeared as counsel and I told the judge that essentially what they're saying is you and I are stupid because when it was in English, there was no problem. But you know, obviously, Muslims like you and me, we don't understand the language. <laughs> so you know, so, And she says, yeah, I agree with you, and she quashed it. Um, so, uh, then we also have the um, Official Secrets Act um, and all that entails, and it's not quite as um, limited in its scope as perhaps its counterparts in the UK and other, other jurisdictions that have it. Um, it. What it allows for is to, 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 deem, to deem secret anything that Cabinet discusses. Um, anything that's put before Cabinet is deemed an official secret in Malaysia. And this has raised some interesting um, imp uh, consequences or implications. I'm in, I'm, I've just finished arguing a case in our apex court on the freedom of information as a constitutional right. Uh, we have a written constitution. Um, and it's interesting that the case ultimately comes down to this. Um, a particular document, which was prepared for the purpose of a concession agreement, was put before cabinet as an, an annex to a cabinet paper. So the government says that for that document is deemed a secret which is ridiculous. And during the, the arguments, we won in the High Court. Um, I'm quite surprised. In the Court of Appeal, we lost by a majority decision. And it was interesting, in the Court of Appeal, one of the things that came up, and one of the judges asked counsel for the government, look, if your photograph was annexed to, um, to a cabinet paper, does that mean that we can't look at that photograph anymore? <laughs> and counsel uh, steadfastly said yes. And then another judge then says, does that mean we can't ever look at you again? Because you're a, walk <laughs> you're a walking official secret now. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, she said yes. So, um, and you know, we were quite confident about that case, but we lost it, and we, we've, we're waiting for a decision from the Apex Court now. Mm -hmm. Now, putting all this aside, then in, in countries like Malaysia, and to some extent Brunei, um, we have uh, Islamic legislation. Um, and although it's always been the case that such legislation was supposed to be limited for, to Islamic law, per private law, or personal law purposes, it's now being utilized as a way to further uh, attempts to stifle. So one of the curious things we have there is an, is an offense that uh, we're not allowed to insult uh, muftis. That's an offense. So I can't say that mufti is stupid. A mufti is a, a religious leader, all right? Um, I can't publish material that is in contravention of Islamic law, whatever that means. Um, so in, in, in that sense, what's happened is there was this book banning case of Rishat Manji's book. Um, it's interesting, it was sold by Borders, the, the bookstore, in, in KL, Kuala Lumpur, and there was this raid by the Islamic authorities, and ultimately the, the manager of that particular outlet has been charged. So you know, ignore the corporate personality, ignore the fact that she's an employee, just focus on the fact that she's Muslim, and whack her in the Islamic courts where, again, you're subjected to the kind of justice that only seems to um, apply in these types of courts. I mean, I, uh, Islamic judges have a tendency of saying the Constitution doesn't apply to them. And this is quite shocking to me. But we've been saying this for about 15 years in Malaysia, and it's something that no one seems to be too interested in, in addressing. So when we speak of um, um, uh, speech crimes in the context of what's happening in Southeast Asia, what we're really talking about is a tremendous rule of law concern. And, and the effect of all these laws and the way in which they are applied by co-opted institutions 
um, including sadly in some cases the judiciary, um, uh, results in a, in a breakdown you know, of, of democracy. So when we talk of, um, of tweaking legislation, and I, I, I listen with envy to, to Lord Lester about what it is that's happening in the UK, because you know, in, in, in our parliament, um, I, I'm, I think they're afraid of televising it because it would, should be, it would then be shown on the comedy channel. <laughs> you know, um, the level of sophistication is, is, you can't even call it sophistication anymore. It's just non-existent. So, so that's, that's my first point about the, the, the nature of the, of the issue. It's actually a rule of law. I'm not going to take as long on my second point. Don't worry, Simon. Um, <laughs> and it's really a rule by law situation. And you know, the struggle is a lot more fundamental for, for many of us. All right, then you know, you've got this other, other situation that, that comes up, and this is my second point. Uh, so what do you do with cultural nuances? So I was just looking at the, uh, the Vietnam Constitution this morning, the 92 Constitution, and I'm just gonna trouble you to read um, Article, uh, well, firstly, Article 11 says this, uh, and I'm doing this, I hope I'm getting it right, there's a Vietnamese colleague here. Uh, Article 11 says, citizens exercise their right as masters at the grassroots level by taking part in state and social affairs. They have the obligation to protect public property and legitimate rights and interests of citizens to preserve national security and social order and safety and the organization of public life. Wow, all right. Then Article 50 says, um, essentially the individual citizen is guaranteed political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights that are recognized by the Constitution. However, Article 51 says, and I quote, the rights of citizens are inseparable from their obligations. The state guarantees the rights of citizens and citizens must fulfill their obligations towards the state and society. Now, I mean, Vietnam has said it, but essentially that's what many of the countries in this part of the world are talking about when they talk about Asian values. And they say, well, you know, we, we accept that you, have, you as an individual have your rights, but surely you have duties as well. You know, and you can't put yourself ahead of the interests of the nation. Hence, anything and everything that the government says is counter to national security, and I'm exaggerating that a little bit because I'm a bit um, annoyed by it, um, <laughs> uh, is a national security problem. So, I think when we, when we engage on these sorts of issues amongst us, I think we have to be alive to the fact that the problems are, are, are much more fundamental and that when, when we talk of solutions in some uh, countries, those solutions may be just something on a wish list for many of us. And I hope, and I, I, I say that with the, with, with the greatest respect to the organizers, of course, and I, as I said, I'm happy to have come here to share this with you. Um, lastly, if, if anyone wants to have a feel of what it is that's happening out there, there's this interesting document in your handout, uh, in your, hand, in your um, pack, a uh, document issued by Freedom House, um, the Internet Freedom, Over uh, Freedom of the Net Overview for 2013. And I was just looking down the list of things that are happening in the various countries that, that uh, Freedom House looked at. I noticed that Malaysia is not mentioned, but I think we've come, I, it would be correct to say that almost every uh, area of criticism is something that we're experiencing in Malaysia. And I think you could say the same for many of the other countries in Southeast Asia. So I leave that with you to think about. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Malik. I, I know we're running fairly late on time, but given the importance of this topic, maybe we can take a few uh, questions. Who would want to begin, please? I see the hand at the back there. Yep. And if I could ask everyone just to try to keep their questions fairly short and to the point. Hi, thanks. Uh, when I spoke yesterday, you know, uh, one of the things that I mentioned was whether we look at the internet and media law policy from a freedom of expression point of view or whether from a democracy point of view. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad in a way that Imtiaz has um, put it quite succinctly that end of the day it all boils down to the rule of law. And in the context of Southeast Asia, this is very important. One of the key features of rule of law, as all of you would know, is a good sense of separation of powers, judiciary, executive, and, and, um, and, and the legislature. But one often finds that the judiciary in Southeast Asia are rather compliant. And perhaps my question, rather, is maybe directed to uh, Lord Lester and uh, Ravi and, and even Imtiaz. What can some of us lawyers do to try and strengthen the institution of judiciary? Um, bearing, taking into account that most of the time that they are appointed by the state, 
or at least the appointment gets the approval of the state. But what can lawyers on the outside do to try and strengthen the institution of judiciary? Thank you. Uh, well, obviously, there are uh, all kinds of uh, bodies um, seeking to do that. Uh, the International Bar Association, uh, the ICJ, the Bingham Institute for the Rule of Law, uh, national bar associations, the American Bar Association, and so on. Um, I don't have any magic solution. I was once asked by a Chinese judge who spent uh, many months uh, in England with three other Chinese judges, and I took her to a trial in Northern Ireland, uh, and, uh, which I was taking part in. And uh, on the way back, she said to me, um, tell me, do you think the judge was independent? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do think he was independent. And then she said, tell me, uh, how do you get judges to be independent? And I said, well, uh, in England, it took 300 years to do that. Um, and then she said, you know, I and the other three Chinese judges who spent a year in England have come to believe in the independence of the judiciary. But when I go back to China, uh, if I find in favor of someone against the government, the president of my tribunal will tell me I will never be promoted. And when I talk to my husband in a commercial case, he will say, I have to find in favor of his firm. What do you think about that? And, and I said, what I think about that is I could not be a judge in, in China. Um, I, I think you're talking, you're asking a question to which there's no really sensible answer, except we all have to do the best we can to fight uh, and fight again uh, and try and hope as human beings that we will not take the line of least resistance. I think the, the main problem is we live in, this is one of the problems about the internet. We talk all the time about the virtues of the internet. One of the problems is we live in mass societies with mass politics, with mass media, with mass production, with mass consumption. And the pressures to conform are ever greater. And the only way that we will get, in my view, rule of law and independent judges and the independent legal profession is by standing up against those pressures. And there's no solution to that which is, can be done just simply by a new law. In Singapore, um, as compared to, I always envy my Malaysian friends <laughs> because there's a strong tradition of the bar and you will see the lawyers who are marching in the streets to strengthen the independence of the judiciary. In Singapore, you have a very weak parliament, um, s small opposition, you have weak institutions. Uh, basically, the press is completely controlled, which is supposed to be the fourth institution under the separation of powers. And I won't say anything about the judiciary. <laughs> the thing is that um, when I started my human rights lawyering, and that's one of the reasons why I started, I mean, basically, it's, it's up to us as individual lawyers how we want to go. And um, lawyers were generally shying away from uh, representing uh, defamation cases against political leaders like Lee Kuan Yew and also uh, taking up controversial cases. So when I started taking up these cases, they're saying that you know, it's a lost cause and uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult and don't waste your time and, and so on and so forth. But the last judgment that we had in Singapore, uh, which was quite a historic judgment, I happened to argue the case where the Prime Minister did not hold, um, when a seat became vacant in a, in, a seat, uh, uh, in a constituency, the last 25 years there were no by-elections. And the Prime Minister said, in this particular case, instance when there was a vacation of that seat uh, because of one of the MPs resigned, and he maintained that um, under the Constitution that he does have a discretion not to hold a by-election. So one of my clients challenged, and the Court of Appeal of Singapore held that the Prime Minister does not have the discretion. So there, there was, you can see that the judiciary is make, already starting to make statements. So I think that um, the increasing amount of constitutional challenges in Singapore reveal that the judiciary is, um, um, I won't say they are being, being activist, but they are restoring their judicial activities um, in par with uh, some standards. <laughs> so I think that um, 
um, I think increasing number of lawyers should come step forward and do our bit as well to push uh, the rule of law framework. Just, just to jump in, um, all right, I, I share to some extent uh, the sentiments of uh, Lord Lester on this, but I think from an activist standpoint, there are things that we can try to do. Um, uh, one of the things I've noticed about countries in which perhaps at one point in history their judiciaries were fairly acceptable of, 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 of a good standard uh, but have since declined uh, is that if they're put under scrutiny, um, perhaps by the press or perhaps by international obs observers, uh, the IBA, uh, it's, it's worked for some of the cases I've done, uh, that's, 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 that's useful. Um, then uh, take the Malaysian example, there's a second part to this. Um, Perhaps um, exchanges of, of, of um, experience between uh, institutions in different countries or different jurisdictions. So in Malaysia, we're partial to the, the English courts because we've applied English law for many years. Um, uh, when we cite House of Lords, uh, uh, Supreme Court authorities in the Malaysian courts right now, the judges tend to listen a little bit more. Um, there's still some measure of deference to the English courts, and you know one of the things that could be done. And I'm, I'm not just talking about Malaysia, but it goes back to uh, how it is that we could help, perhaps even Mr. Pu, is that if there was more collaboration between bar, bar councils or law societies and and the and the judici judicial institutions of these countries, I understand the sensitivity to that. But I've you know we've had a good relationship with the English courts and and the Australian courts, and I remember on one occasion Michael Kirby. Um, the former uh, Chief Justice of, of the High Court, who's, who's a frequent visitor to Malaysia, uh, uh, came over for a, for a judicial training workshop. And uh, he spoke of something called the Bangalore Principles, which essentially was an agreement between uh, Commonwealth uh, judiciaries that if there was no specific constitutional provision or law on a particular matter which concerned a human right, then the judiciary could look to international norms to, to, to fill that gap. And he spoke about that. And coincidentally or otherwise, some about four or five weeks after his, his training, um, a judgment was delivered in, the, in a first instance court in, in Malaysia on a matter of indigenous rights to land. And the judge cited the Bangalore principles. And I'd like to think it was because he had been shown the way by someone whose, whose wisdom and, and, and learning could not in any way be, be doubted or, or, or whose intentions could not be doubted. So, I think there are ways we have to collaborate. It's just a matter of understanding what we need to do, and I think we need to work closely with civil society and and the uh, and the law uh, law bodies, and to the extent possible, the, the judiciary as well of these different countries. Thank you. I just wanted to add one one or two things. In fact, I absolutely agree. I want to say something about the, what we call the Bangalore principles, but also something historical. Um, many many years ago. I was on the British Council Law Committee that was concerned with the rule of law. And Lord Diplock uh, chaired it. And well before Dr. Mahathir interfered with the Malaysian judiciary, Lord Diplock said, I am very worried about what is happening in Malaysia. Uh, and he and Lord Oliver knew it well because they knew from Sufian days and they could see what was coming. I was very impressed. And when, uh, in fact, it did come, they were extremely good, the two law lords, in standing up to rule law in Malaysia. Then, with these Bangalore principles, I, I mean, I actually w w was doing the 10 Bangalore, post-Bangalore judicial colloquia in private. The very first one, was attended by Tun Sali Abba, the Lord President of the Council of Malaysia. Now, he was a very conservative judge, like myself. But as he sat with his other judges in private, in Bangalore, he became more interested in judicial review. And when he went back to Malaysia, he gave a public lecture of a very moderate kind in favor of judicial review. At which point, Dr. Mahathir, uh, uh, removed him from office, if you remember, because of the lecture, removed him altogether as head of the judiciary, and then when Malaysian judges <laughs> in the Supreme Court uh, uh, intervened, he removed them as well. And then having removed them as well, 
He set up that commission of inquiry. So the point of my story is that the Bangalore experience produced a network of judges all over the world who were great, used international standards and rule of law, but sometimes it led to masters. And he was one of the masters, um, and, and he'd done almost nothing at all, but it was quite enough for his removal. And I, I strongly believe in what he was saying, which is uh, contact with your peers, with other judges, with other panels, and getting the judges themselves in private to know what's happening in each other's country, and then taking concern, as Lord Chipsloss and Lord Oliver did, about what was happening in Malaysia privately makes a big difference. All right, can I ask people to just put up your hands if you have any more questions? And what I'll do is I'll just take people's questions and we'll ask the panel to respond. I know, I think Churum uh, had, had a question. Uh, sorry. Yes, let's stand in front of Mike. And Tom has a question. Um, anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for uh, Lord Lester. Uh, I fully um, uh, appreciate the, uh, the problem with blasphemy law. Uh, and we can in Singapore, where I'm from, you know, you see the way it can be abused, uh, essentially to to stifle speech. Uh, my uh, question, though, is this: I mean, uh, in theory, uh, the the liberal liberal response uh, would be that um, uh, religious offence is not unproblematic, but this is a problem that shouldn't be solved uh, by criminalising it, but through other non-legal means, whether it's uh, media ethics or education and so on. So my question is, uh, in, in in the UK context. Uh, do you have much faith in these non-legal means of uh, addressing problems like Islamophobia and racist speech and so on? Uh, because if, if we don't, then uh, the pressure to use legal means is bound to uh, persist, won't it? Okay, so non-legal means and then Tom? Uh, question for the uh, Honorable Mr. Uh, Kwok. I want to thank you for your excellent remarks on Article 23. Uh, and my question is, the conventional wisdom as I understand it in Hong Kong is that uh, it would be so politically toxic for the government to move forward again uh, on Article 23 that they won't uh, do it. Do you agree with that uh, uh, conventional wisdom uh, such that we are safe from any movement on Article 23 for, let's say, the next <coughs> five years or so? And number two, uh, is there an opportunity to actually move the needle in the other direction, which is to say, offer the kind of legislation getting rid of uh, some of the speech crimes laws that are still on the books. Um, uh, on the first question about um, uh, race hate speech, um, I I'm a Jew and some of my family were killed in death camps in Europe. But I do not believe that you can use criminal law effectively to counter racism except in the most exceptional circumstances. Why? Leaving aside the question of principle uh, as to whether it's desirable to punish unless there is an incitement to violence or an imminent th threat of violence, the problem about laws of that kind is they're bad whether you win or you lose. If you win, you create martyrs. If you lose, then the uh, racist um, Islamophobe, anti-Semite, anti-black, whatever, um, is able to say, they tried to get me, my free speech was violated, uh, and I succeeded. And you then legitimize the evil speech. And so, although I don't quote quite as far as the United States position, I agree with them that the best remedy for evil speech is not less speech, but more speech. Uh, there is a serious problem of Islamophobia in Britain, no question. Uh, but I don't believe that prosecuting uh, Islamophobes is the way to do it. It has to be done politically, culturally, winning the argument, in my view. A and I think it's dangerous for British Muslims to attack free speech, as they often do. It's not in their interest. And Jews do the same. Some of the, those in Britain most in favor of race hate speech are the board of, uh, uh, the British board of uh, Jews. Um, doesn't, it's no good, in my view, as a way of countering those evils. And you have a jury and the criminal burden of proof and all the publicity 
uh, and it, it really blows up in one's face, I think. Yes, thank you for your question. So your question is basically whether the national security bill will be reintroduced to, to LegCo in any time in the near future. My political assessment now, you ask me, is no. The government doesn't have the political capital to move for uh, such a controversial bill uh, to be passed uh, in, in LegCo. But with the uh, political climate in Hong Kong, if you've been following uh, the political developments in Hong Kong, um, it is extremely volatile at the moment. Um, parties are engaged, it's basically in a stalemate. Uh, there'll be huge protests tomorrow, Sunday. Uh, I, my, my estimate is that at least 200,000 people will take to the streets tomorrow on the issue of a, a, a recent uh, controversy involving the uh, TV license. Um, and with such kind of protests erupting any point in time, and with the occupied central movement on the horizon, I cannot say for sure what the National Security Council in Beijing is thinking right now and whether they would see the situation as so, so uh, toxic or so volatile, so dangerous out of control that they might just ask this government, this chief executive, just, I know it's gonna kill you politically, but sorry, this is your, your, your task. I don't know whether that will happen, but it may. So um, do, do wash out um, the, the developments closely in Hong Kong. I, I just want to say something slightly controversial, which is uh, <laughs> I, I didn't completely agree with Jenny. That, that's a very courageous thing for me to say. Uh, and the reason I didn't completely agree is I didn't hear, hear at any point in what she said uh, any concern about national security. Uh, and one of the problems is everybody here is in one sense on one side, but there's nobody here from the security service, no one here who has to worry about those things. And uh, I mean, the, the Justice Initiative, what is the name of our principles? The Chuana Principles. The uh, um, OSI Justice Initiative have articulated uh, a whole set of principles balancing free speech against national security with standards of legal certainty and proportionality. Uh, and those are being accepted uh, all over the place. And I think that, uh, although I accept a great deal of what's been said, I really think that we have to recognize that some restraints on free speech in the interests of national security are needed. Uh, otherwise, it's, it would sound as though a completely incontinent release of material, regardless of uh, safety, the safety of security agents and so on, would be something that we would seek to defend. And I don't really think that I would, even though I think I've spent my life defending free speech, uh, I, I remember, for example, <laughs> in America, the case of SNEP. You remember SNEP was a, uh, you don't remember. SNEP was a case where um, the Supreme Court unusually did award a, a prior restraint in order to protect the security service. So I don't think I take the completely absolute position which is taken <laughs> by, for example, uh, Floyd Abrams and Hugo, uh, Hugo Black, the late Hugo Black. And there are other Americans here who may disagree. Just to respond to that, in that what I was saying is not that national security should never be considered, but that there ought to be protection for certain public interest disclosures. And if you, perhaps taking those principles, you could explain to us how you think under those principles Edward Snowden should be treated. Because at present, and I actually have a copy, um, it just goes to show the government's leak when they want to. This is a copy of the charge sheet for Edward Snowden, which clearly says under seal, but is clearly available on the internet. Um, he was charged with, with espionage, and under the current provisions, um, and the way in which the law has been interpreted, he would never be able to tell the jury about that his intent was not to help foreign countries, it was to inform the public, and that the government's secret interpretation of laws used to justify spying without their knowledge was used. He would never be able to explain to a jury how his leak sparked dozens of lawsuits, um, reform, reform discussions in numerous countries around the world. Now, that I think is an unacceptable position, but there has to be 
I agree with you that there's got to be a balance. But where do you see that balance? And how would you apply, for example, these principles to Edward Snowden? I mean, uh, um, you're in the case. I, I'm not, but I, uh, I mean, my answer. I'm actually not in the Snowden my, case. My, I my just use it as an example. My, my answer. <laughs> I mean, when we amended the dreadful Official Secrets Act, or rather, we, we got rid of it in the 1911 one. Uh, I, I remember in those days, if you disclosed the color of the wallpaper in the cabinet office, that was considered to be a criminal offense. And we replaced it in 1989 with an Official Secrets Act that was meant to be as narrow as possible, but in compliance with the European Human Rights Convention. <coughs> the Espionage Act is plainly a piece of antique legislation that has probably not recently been subjected to scrutiny of, under the First Amendment. But if you want an example, um, which I mentioned before, of really bad United States jurisprudence, which you need to be alerted to, take the humanitarian law project disgraceful case. In that case, a group of, of, of law professors were advising the PKK, uh, a terrorist organization of, of Kurds, about how to petition the United Nations. And it came to the Supreme Court, and the question was uh, whether uh, charging these law professors with uh, aiding terrorism uh, violated the First Amendment. A and to my amazement, the Supreme Court, by a majority, said, uh, as Lord Diplock had said in another context years before, this case had nothing to do with free speech. It's entirely about national security. Therefore, the First Amendment has no application. Now, that's an example going way the other way, and I don't think British judges would conceivably take that view. I think if you look at the case law in our House of Lords and Supreme Court, they've been extremely careful to stand up to the state when national security is invoked uh, unnecessarily. Um, in, in the, in the Espionage Act, I would have thought, would, ought to be struck down uh, in the way that the Sedition Act would have been had it ever been tested. But I see Rob over there nodding, and I hope I'm right. down anytime soon. Um, I, I do want to actually pick up one other point with what you said was the reason I think that uh, uh, the New York Times or the Guardian contacts the government is not only to protect themselves against uh, uh, prosecution, but because they're engaged in responsible journalism. They actually want to know what the government has to say and to make their own editorial choice about whether they think it's a good idea to publish it or not. So I, 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 uh, I, I do not necessarily think that we should forget about the role that's played by the press and how I worry a little bit sometimes that we forget uh, that, you know, for example, Mr. Stone, it's a very, to my mind, hard case because of course it's in the public interest to disclose the information. He was also a government employee. And so was bound by certain, whether we like it or not, restrictions because he was a, a government employee. And I sometimes do wonder when uh, everyone is a publisher, do we possibly risk the kinds of protection we've historically accorded to a free press? So. I'm very sorry. I'm going to have to cut this off because uh, it's, uh, you know, it's <laughs> most engaging. But we've got to move on. But what can I say to this panel? Maybe you can come back when we do our Article 23 conference <laughs> in the next few years. I'd like to reconvene the same panel because you guys have been great. So please join me in thanking the panelists.